this whole course is going to be full of technical difficulties. This is my first Zoom course. I assume other people have done Zoom courses before, and you're probably used to things going wrong all the time. I'm not, but yeah, okay. Functions valued in Barnack spaces. This is what they look like. F mapping a measure space, for example, R into X. So this is a measure space. And this is a Barnack space. And I want to think of Barnack spaces as purely abstract Barnack spaces. So you might have particular examples in mind of Barnack spaces like LP spaces or some other Barnack space, a Hilbert space, bounded operators on Hilbert space. There are plenty of examples of Barnack spaces. And I want you to not think of particular Barnack spaces here. I want you to think of this purely as a vector space with a complete norm. And this all sounds very tautological because that's what a Barnack space is. But my whole point with this discussion is I want you to think of just the minimal structure on this Barnack space possible. All you have access to is a norm and completeness. So I'm just gonna emphasize this is an abstract Barnack space. Now, one reason I wanna make that distinction clear is that I want to be able to talk about functions valued in a Barnack space versus functions in a Barnack space. So this here is a function valued in a Barnack space. On the other hand, you can think of a function in a Barnack space For example, you can think of a particular Barnack space. You can do exactly what I told you not to do before. You can take, for example, X to be LP on some measure space like LP of R. And then you can talk about a function F in X, right? This function here is a scalar valued function. because this is F and it's in LP of R. So it's mapping R into the scalar field. Now I'm gonna start calling the scalar field K. By K, I mean R or C, real numbers or complex numbers. Because Barnack spaces can be over the real scalars or over the complex scalars. And most of what I say is valid for both. So I'm often gonna just refer to K as the scalar field. But sometimes I will need to actually set K to be R or K to be C because some things are only true for real spaces or only true for complex spaces. Most things are true for both. Now this distinction between functions valued in a Barnack space and functions in a Barnack space, some Barnack spaces are spaces of functions, right? They consist of functions from some space to scalars, for example, or some other space. And these are not the same thing, right? because you can take, for example, X to be LP, like we said before, and you can consider a function F, I'll generally write these as bold, mapping R to X, which in this case is LP of R, right? So now F is a vector valued function. It's a function valued in LP. It's not a function in LP, it's a function valued in LP. So for, a, for some T and R, f of t will be in LP of r. So what I mean by that is f of t is a function, not a scalar, a function. So you can say f of t of s is in the scalar field. So this can be thought of now as a function of two variables, right? And this is because this particular Barnack space we were thinking of has the extra structure of being a function space. So we have this extra structure of the second variable that we can plug in. So in this particular setting, a vector valued function, a Barnack valued function is actually just a multivariable scalar valued function in disguise. But if X is just a general abstract Barnack space, you can't do that. So it's still a single variable function. It's just, it's values of vectors. And in the abstract, you can't say anything else about how those vectors look. They're just vectors. You can take their norms, you can add them, you can scale them. That's about it. Any questions about that? <laughs> 
just thought it would be good to start with this really pedantic discussion of what this all means. Okay, don't confuse functions in a, in a Banach space and functions valued in a Banach space. I did that all the time when I first started working in this area and I just thought it would be good to, to stop you from doing the same. So what is this course about overall? What's this all about? This course is about taking results from scalar valued analysis which is what you probably think of as real analysis or just analysis. All of your functions are kind of scalar valued without you even thinking about it. And extending all of these results to Banach valued functions. And the key point to take home from this first lecture is that not everything works. So this course isn't about just taking everything from scalar valued analysis and proving it for Banach valued functions and calling it a day, right? The fact is that not everything works and some things work sometimes depending on the Banach space. Some things do work all the time. They work for every Banach space and you have to prove that in some different way. This course is about these distinctions between what works, what doesn't work, how to prove some things work and then to apply the things we've established to solve some problems, say. So, that's not really the best overview of what this course is about, but it'll do. I'll give two examples. These are in the introduction to the notes. So if you've already read the notes, then congratulations, you already know this. Example one is the Fourier transform. Now for a scalar valued function, let's say a function on R into the complex numbers, just because Fourier analysis works best over the complex numbers. The Fourier transform is F hat. It's also a complex valued function on the real line. And the way it's defined is for every frequency Xi, F hat of Xi is the integral over R of F against a complex exponential. And I assume most of you have seen this. If you haven't, that's okay. You'll pick it up as you go, but I think most of you have seen this. And Fourier analysis is about doing as much as possible in terms of the Fourier transform, as you probably know. And the fundamental theorem of Fourier analysis, in my view, it's a Plancharel theorem. Which in its most basic form, I guess, says that the L2 norm of the Fourier transform is equal to the L2 norm of the original function. Or equivalently stated the Fourier transform is an isometry on L2. And it takes a bit of work to do this. It's pretty non-trivial. It's not exceptionally hard, but it's, it doesn't follow automatically from the definition at all. And let me write this out in terms of what the L2 norm actually is. This will help us later on. This is the L2 norm of the Fourier transform and the L2 norm of the original function. <coughs> so the first question we'll ask is, does this extend to Banach valued functions in any way? Let me scroll down, start a new page. Oh, maybe I'll leave this up. So for a complex Barnack space, we need a complex Barnack space because when you define the Fourier transform, you have these complex exponentials and you want to be able to multiply vectors by those. So the Barnack space has to be over the complex numbers. This can be done for real Banach spaces, but I don't want to get into that. So for a complex Banach space and for a Banach valued function F, I will try my best to draw this in bold. We can define the Fourier transform pretty much in the same way. So this is still a function on R and it's still an X valued function. 
we take the definition from before and we just write it out again. So if every frequency psi, this is not in X, this is in R. So it's an integral over R. Let's put this exponential out the front just to make things a little bit clearer. This is our definition of the X valued Fourier transform. And I have to unpack this a little bit because not everything here is defined yet. Not everything's gonna make sense as it's written. So this is a vector, F of X. You can tell it's a vector because I wrote it in bold, right? This here is a complex number. So this product of the, the scalar and the vector is defined. So this is a vector in X. And what we want to do is integrate these vectors to get out a vector. This is done by using the Bochner integral, which I'll introduce in the next lecture, I think. For now, you can just think that the Bochner integral is like the X valued version of the Lebesgue integral. And it, the X, it is, the Bochner integral is the X valued Lebesgue integral essentially. But we have to define it for abstract Banach spaces X. In the notes, I do this where X is finite dimensional, and then you can just pick a basis and then do the, the integral in each basis vector in each coordinate, and you get the right result. That will be the Bochner integral for a finite dimensional space. So this is our Fourier transform. And we can ask ourselves the question, does Plancherel's theorem hold in some way? I say in some way, because you might already expect that the Plancherel theorem is not going to hold and we're gonna to have to generalize it a little bit to get it to work. So more precisely, what we're gonna ask for is, does there exist a constant C, which is finite, such that the L2 norm of the Fourier transform, which we have to define because now we're looking at vector valued functions and we need to say what their L2 norm is. So this here is the, the L2 norm of a vector valued function. We write this as F hat L2 of R, but valued in X using this notation here. Does there exist a constant C such that this L2 norm is bounded by the L2 norm of the original function? And I'll write that out like this. Because now you've seen the definition. So what we're asking here is, is the Fourier transform, which we might write as curly F, is it bounded on the X valued L2 space? Sorry, my screen is messing up a little bit here. Well, So in the scalar valued setting, the Plancherel theorem said that the Fourier transform is an isometry on L2. So not only is it bounded, it actually it gives you equalities of norms. And here we're asking for something a bit weaker. We're just asking for boundedness. We don't need to have a quality of norms, but we want that the norm of the, the L2 norm of the Fourier transform is controlled by the L2 norm of the original function, possibly up to a constant. And this constant is independent, this constant here, C is independent of F. So we'd want this say for all F in L2 valued in X. And the short answer is no. <laughs> the long answer is a bit longer. There's a theorem that we'll hopefully get to by the end of the course by Kwapien. I don't know if this is pronounced right. When was this 1972? So the Fourier transform is bounded on L2 valued in X, if and only if X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. Okay. And when you see this theorem for the first time, this should make you think, okay, so Barnack valued Fourier analysis is not really possible unless you work with Hilbert spaces. 
or things that are isomorphic to them. That's not the case, of course, otherwise this course wouldn't exist. But this does tell you that this fundamental theorem of Fourier analysis, this Plancherel theorem, is only going to hold in some, the boundedness version of the Plancherel theorem is only going to hold when you work with Hilbert spaces or things that are isomorphic to them. And just in case you've forgotten, Barnack spaces like LP for P not equal to two are, are not isomorphic to Hilbert spaces. I should write that out. Sorry? Yep. Uh, what does isomorphic mean in this context? Good question. Good question. Let's put a little side note here. X is isomorphic to a Banach space Y if there exists a bounded linear invertible map T from X to Y. And the invertibility is pretty clear here. So this is what you would call an isomorphism. So every vector in X corresponds to a vector of Y in a linear bijective way, and the norms are controlled as well. So what you'll have in particular here is that the, the, the Y norm of a vector TX for X in X will be controlled by some constant times the original norm. This is just T being bounded, but you will also have a control from below coming from the inverse, let's say like that. So you can think of them as being one Barnack space, but with two equivalent norms. This is an equivalent way of looking at it. I didn't see who asked the question, but did that answer the question? Yeah, thanks. Very good. Thanks for being the first question, by the way. Good on you. Someone had to do it. So the fact is that most Barnack spaces, particularly well, finite dimensional Barnack spaces are all isomorphic to Hilbert spaces. You know the result from real analysis at some point that if you have two norms on Rn or on Cn, then they're equivalent. What this is telling you is that every finite dimensional Barnack space is isomorphic to some Hilbert space. But this isn't true for infinite dimensional Barnack spaces. Most pretty much all Barnack spaces are not isomorphic to Hilbert spaces. That's why Barnack space theory is a thing, right? So this theorem is not giving a lot of hope for Barnack valued Fourier analysis. But let's move on to another example to give us some hope. The Hilbert transform. I realize probably not everybody in the class has done a harmonic analysis course before. I would guess that maybe half of you have. So I'm gonna tell you some stuff as if you know it, but it's okay that you don't know it. I'm gonna teach it again and we're gonna prove these things in a different way. So this is not assumed knowledge, but you know, it, it'll be good for you to see it. For a scalar valued function F, the Hilbert transform of F is denoted HF. It's also a complex valued function on R and it's defined like this. So it's a, what's called a principal value integral. I will define it. F of X minus Y, dy on Y. So the problem that makes this sort of hard to define is that this kernel one on Y is not integrable. on R. So you can't simply take this integral of F against one on Y because this integral is never going to be defined in any reasonable sense. You define this as a limit as epsilon goes to zero. There's a few different ways to do this. This is my preferred way. You take only the Y such that the modulus of Y is greater than epsilon. so that the, the singularity of one on Y at the origin gets avoided. And as long as F decays fast enough, this integral is gonna make sense. And if F decays fast enough and is also smooth enough, then this limit's going to be defined. You can also define it if you want as the limit as epsilon goes to zero. You can take epsilon less than modulus Y less than one on epsilon 
and you can truncate the singularity at the origin and also the not good enough decay at infinity. And then you can get th this kernel one on Y is integrable in this region for every epsilon. This limit might blow up, but at least for every epsilon, this is defined. So this is the Hilbert transform. It's pretty important in PDEs, in complex analysis, in many other things. And it's important in the theory of Fourier multipliers because it's kind of the first non-trivial Fourier multiplier. So it is a Fourier multiplier. I'll say what this means with symbol M of Xi equals minus I signum of Xi. So this signum here is plus one or minus one according to the sign of Xi. Christoph can correct me here. Do I need a constant? Am I missing a constant in this definition? He's muted. Well, let me think about this. Uh, or we can just move on. Maybe I'm missing a constant of like a pi, if, pi if or it something. Is a pi, yeah. Maybe there's a pi there. It doesn't make much difference though. Yeah. Like you're going to get a constant multiple of the Hilbert transform. This is all I can. So what I mean by this, the Hilbert transform being a Fourier multiplier, is that the Hilbert transform of F can be obtained by taking F, taking its Fourier transform, multiplying it pointwise by this symbol, and then taking the inverse Fourier transform of that. So on the frequency side, on the Fourier side, the Hilbert transform is just multiplication by this symbol, minus I, possibly times pi, sigma of xi. Yep. So by Plancherel's theorem, the isometry of the Fourier transform of L2, if you take the L2 norm of the Hilbert transform of a function, you can write it out like this as a Fourier multiplier. Now you use Plancherel here to say that the L2 norm of the, well, the inverse Fourier transform, same thing, is the L2 norm of what's on the inside. You can then say, well, this is bounded by the L infinity norm of the multiplier times the L2 norm of the function. This is one, or maybe it's pi, depending on whether I forgot the pi or not. And then you use Plancherel again and say, okay, this is just the L2 norm of F. So what this tells you is that the Hilbert transform is bounded on L2. In fact, any Fourier multiplier with a bounded symbol is bounded on L2, but the Hilbert transform is just one example of that. So H is bounded on L2. Now everything here is scalar valued, right? I haven't done any vector valued things here. This is all for scalar valued functions and I've used the Plancherel theorem and this is gonna make you think maybe this isn't gonna work so well for Barnard valued things. Before that, I should just note, it's also bounded on LP of R for all p between one and infinity, not including the endpoints. You can prove this by Calder and Zygmunt theory, which I'm not going to teach in this course. And if you don't know it, that's okay. You can also do it using Fourier multiplier theorems, which I am gonna prove in this course. But where was I? So with the Fourier transform, the Plancherel theorem says that that's bounded on L2, but it's not bounded on LP for any other p's. You have boundedness from LP to LQ for Q, the conjugate exponent to P, but it's not actually bounded on LP. The Hilbert transform on the other hand is bounded on LP for P in this range. So the behavior is a bit different to the Fourier transform. It's a different type of operator. So what about Barnack valued functions? What's happening here? So let's take X to be a Barnack space. I'm gonna start abbreviating this as B space because it takes too long to write Barnack every time. And I'm gonna write the word Barnack about a thousand times in this course. So it's a B space. Incidentally, this is what Barnack originally called them. So this is justified. We're gonna make, it's gonna be a complex Barnack space so that this Fourier multiplier makes sense for a 
Barnack valued function f and x valued function f, we can define the Hilbert transform of f in basically the same way. It's a principal value. Making sure this f is bold. Now again, this is going to be a Bochner integral. Remember, we have to generalize the Lebesgue integral to Barnack valued functions. We're going to use that same integral here. And it's still going to be a Fourier multiplier. Inverse Fourier transform m times f hat m as before. Where now the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform are now the x valued ones using the Bochner integral, of course. So if x is isomorphic to a Hilbert space, let's say an h space h for Hilbert, then you'll have the boundedness of the Hilbert transform, the x-valued Hilbert transform on L2. And I won't write out every little detail, but it's the same Plantarell argument from before. So you're going to have a constant C that comes out because now the, the x-valued Plantarell theorem that we have has a constant. And that would show that the so the Hilbert transform H is bounded on L2 valued in X. But this is if X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space, right? And you might think at this point, okay, this is going to happen if and only if X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space, but no, you'd be wrong. In this case, we can do a little bit more. So this is a theorem by Burkholder and Bogan. in 1983, I think, it's a little bit newer. Your Hilbert transform is bounded on L2 or equivalently on LP for all P between one and infinity. If and only if X has what is called the UMD property. I'm going to highlight that. Now, I presume none of you know what the UMD property is at this stage. If you do, you probably don't need this course, but maybe you do. This is probably the most important theorem of the course, by the way, this one. So unlike the case of the Fourier transform, you can actually have boundedness of this X-valued Hilbert transform without the Barnack space being isomorphic to a Hilbert space. As long as it's got this so-called UMD property, if and only if you have this so-called UMD property, you'll have boundedness of the Hilbert transform. I need to tell you a little bit about the UMD property so that you can see the, the significance of this. What is UMD? It stands for, for this unconditionality of martingale differences. Now at this point, all of the probability students in the course, which I think about a third of the course are like, yes, good, I'm fine. We, we can deal with this. The other two thirds are like, hang on, what's going on here? Um, so martingales are the fundamental class of stochastic processes. probably the most important class of stochastic processes. And unconditionality is a property of sequences in a Barnack space, which is something like orthogonality or sort of like independence to use the probabilistic terminology. And given that this property has a name, you immediately realize, okay, not every Barnack space has the UMD property, but it should be an interesting class of Barnack spaces. And just by the name UMD, you can tell this is sort of a probabilistic condition. It came from the theory of probability in Barnack spaces or Barnack space valued random variables and stochastic processes. But the fact that you've got this Burkholder-Borgan theorem that the Hilbert transform is bounded 
the, the X valued Hilbert transform is bounded if and only if X has this probabilistic property of saying that this is kind of also a harmonic analytic property, which you can define in terms of the Hilbert transform if you want to. It's also telling you that deep in the background somewhere, there's a, a subtle link between the Hilbert transform or analysis of the Hilbert transform and analysis of martingales. This is the, the deep content of, of this theorem. I should mention as well as Burkholder and Borgan, there's two separate papers. Burkholder showed that UMD property implies boundedness of Hilbert transform. Borgan showed that boundedness of Hilbert transform implies UMD property at around the same time. I presume it wasn't independent. I presume they were talking to each other. So what examples do we have of UMD spaces? Hilbert spaces are UMD. You can already figure that out from the theorems I've showed you. You know that the Hilbert transform is bounded on L2 when X is isomorphic to a Hilbert space. And you know that boundedness of the Hilbert transform is equivalent to the UMD property. So you know that being isomorphic to a Hilbert space is good enough for UMD. So I should say Hilbert and isomorphic to Hilbert. Pretty much everything I talk about in this class is invariant under isomorphism. So if, if some space has a property, then isomorphic spaces are also going to have the property. You'll see that when we get to these various properties. So Hilbert spaces are UMD. LP spaces are UMD. Well, not now. LP is UMD for any measure space S. any P between one and infinity, not including endpoints. So LP spaces, which are probably the most familiar Barnack spaces to everybody that are not isomorphic to Hilbert spaces, they're UMD. So they're good. UMD spaces are the good ones. What else? Most natural function spaces are UMD. So you can think of many different types of function spaces that come up in PDE or analysis in general or wherever function spaces come up. For example, Sobolev spaces, WPS, any P between one and infinity, any S in R. Uh, Bessoff spaces, if you know Bessoff spaces, it doesn't matter if you don't. I think P and Q both have to be between one and infinity. S can be anything in R. Which other spaces are I listed on my notes here? I should also add, so you've noticed probably that there's always this restriction that P has to be between one and infinity. It can't be equal to one or infinity. Most natural uh, reflexive function spaces are UMD because in fact, UMD implies reflexivity. We'll come back to this at some point. If you can't remember what a reflexive space is, don't worry, you'll find out soon enough. Also some spaces of operators, a UMD. Barnack spaces don't have to be spaces of functions. A lot of natural spaces are not function spaces. So what's an example? If you've done some operator theory, you might've seen what's called the Shatton classes, SP of H. If you haven't seen this, don't worry. These are subspaces of the bounded operators on a Hilbert space. They have a parameter P, which has to be, no surprise, between one and infinity, not inclusive, because these are examples of non-commutative LP spaces. These are defined in terms of some von Neumann algebra. I'm not really going to go into that in this course, but if you know about von Neumann algebras, you'd like to know that non-commutative LP spaces are UMD as well, as long as they're in this reflexive range, P between one and infinity. Most of this course is about leading up to the theory of UMD spaces and then defining that and then investigating all the equivalent properties and also what you can do with them. How do you do analysis valued in UMD spaces? UMD spaces are the, what you could call the, the nice spaces for Barnack valued analysis. Um, 
particularly for Barnard valued harmonic analysis, if you're into harmonic analysis, or if you're into stochastic analysis, it's incidentally also the, the nice property, but that's not such a surprise because it's defined in terms of martingale differences. That is a natural assumption to make. So we're gonna spend time getting to that definition and I'm hoping you can all understand that and learn how to use it and then apply it in your everyday lives on the street. Someone passes you a Barnard space and asks you, is it UMD? You should be able to prove that it is or isn't. And yeah, so I think now's a good time to have our 10 minute break and then get back to it because this is a, I haven't actually started teaching you anything yet and I'm gonna start teaching you stuff after this. So now's, a, now's break time. Any questions before the break? No. Well, I have maybe a comment, uh, not yep. so much a question. Uh, you've been, uh, uh, well, sometimes writing down an operator and proving bounds for it doesn't always go exactly this order. Sometimes it goes the other way around. For example, if you try to define the Fourier integral for L2 functions, you first need partial L before you can even do it, right? Of course, well, yeah. You would have to think about how to do it very carefully. Yeah. So, I this guess a good point. the yeah. usual solution to this is you just uh, initially give up hope to define things for all functions in such spaces as LP. You would define exactly. for some uh, dense subclasses. For That's example. exactly what we're going to do. Yeah, yeah. So just so for the students' sake, what's going on here is a issue in detail. Yeah, That's what yeah. I thought. That's why I didn't. Uh... So just to scroll back to the Fourier transform, for example, because this is a very good point. This Poincaré theorem that the Fourier transform is an isometry on L2, you need this to be able to define the Fourier transform on L2 functions. Because this integral that defines the Fourier transform, that a priori doesn't make sense when F is just in L2. Because the function you're integrating against is just bounded. You can't use something like Helder's inequality to say that this thing's defined for an L2 function. You can define it for Schwartz functions or L1 functions, for example, then get this a priori L2 estimate and then extend by density to all of L2. And the same thing is going to happen for operators acting on Barnack value functions. You're going to be able to define them on some dense subclass. Then you use something like the UMD property to prove the bound, and then you can extend them by density to the whole class of functions. And we'll talk about that in more depth later on. But yeah, it's a good point. Any other questions? No? Okay, let's take a 10 minute break and then get back to it. 